My name is Clarice Drew, and I'm here in the studio today with the distinguished Dr. Laila Africa. Dr. Africa, welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Great yes. to have you. You do phenomenal work. You've got outstanding books to prove all of that. And your passion is, is health care, and predominantly with an emphasis on what is good for us as African American people. Um, I'd like if we could start briefly, just tell us a little bit about your passion, what led you to that, and, and why you feel qualified to share with us the information that should make a difference in our lives. Well, essentially, I started changing my health in uh, 1970 and started reading books about health and going to seminars and lectures. And I noticed they never mentioned black people or Africa in any way when they talked about nutrition and health. And it kind of irritated me. I said, we must have contributed something. I mean, we built the pyramids. We did this. We must know something about eating. And that set me on a journey of researching. And I used to collect just information. So a sentence here, a paragraph there about the origins of uh, health. Mm -hmm. And uh, ancient medical books, the Ibris Papyrus, the Moscow Papyrus. That, that book is quoted directly by Hippocrates, the Moscow Papyrus. And I found out that we were the ones who started nutrition. It comes from an Egyptian word. Mina, which we get the word menu from. So the whole concept of nutrition, especially natural medicine and natural foods, comes from Africa. And I found that out and had the documentation of when they examined the fossil remains in the pyramids and mm -hmm. saw what they had in the mummy's stomach was whole grains, no bleached white flour, no white sugar, no milk. And I said, oh, we were into natural foods. And, and that started me on this uh, journey to get the information out to other people. So Twinkies were not allowed. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's, no Twinkies in our mummies. No, that wasn't there at yeah. all. Yeah. Was, was there any one pivotal point, though, that just made you say, this is something that I have got to really delve deeper into? I guess what I'm getting at, did it start with what you used to eat as a little boy or what you saw people eat around you or just what triggered it for you? Uh, a chow. My little girl knocked me on my leg like it was a door and said, can you teach me how to know when I'm sick? Hmm. And I said, okay. <laughs> and that triggered me. Nothing keeps me motivated but children. I, sure. I, uh, nothing else. That's what started. That's what started. If I were to ask you to take us back a little bit, uh, Dr. Africa, how would you start that if I were to ask you to take us back to where we came from, where we used to be, and even where you think we're headed? Is, is it as grim as I think it may be? Is the past as wonderful for us health-wise as, as I, most of us think it may have been? Where would we be? Where have we been? Well, the examination of the uh, mummies indicated we were 99% cavity-free. Even when we were 70, 80, and 90 years old, we were cavity-free. So the examination of the mummies itself indicates that we were healthy people, and they found sprouting containers in the pyramids and the the herbal formulas, over 300 different herbal formulas taken out of Tutankhamun's coffin, as they call it, his, uh, when excavated his grave, mm -hmm. had this, not only the, the herbal combination, but the schedule of how to take it, which you call prescriptions today, was taken out of his uh, remains. So we have the evidence that we were very healthy, knew about herbal medicine. We had herbal farms, which the Europeans call orchards. And I found out the people in control of it, Tet and other people, and how they designed the orchards to indicate certain energy fields, which people call feng shui today. So that got me into how to arrange the house using the African system based on our herbal system. 
So we were very healthy until we were introduced to what we call a starch and fats in a diet. Well, I'm going to stop you a minute now. Before we started the starch and fats in our diet, what did we eat? We ate whole foods, which mm -hmm. people call natural foods, which mm -hmm. does not include dairy products or salt or white sugar or any processed grains, which people call bleach white flour today and white rice today. We ate whole, whole foods, yes, mm -hmm. mostly raw. Those in the seed family and grains ripen early where sweet fruits ripen late. So we, what people buy in the store is unripe grains, which they call rice and beans, but they're unripe. So you have to kind of cook them to get that, revert that sugar back to its sure. natural state. But that's what we were eating. And that's been verified over and over again by just going to the pyramids. And they have paintings of what we ate in the pyramids and in the papyrus and coffin texts. They mention exactly what we eat and had paintings of it. We were doing correct food combining not putting starch with meat, which mm -hmm. is illogical and hampers your digestion, mm -hmm. causes constipation and gas, which people call farting or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we weren't combining food incorrectly. Mm -hmm. We were on point now at one time. Right. But then we had this incursion with another people's diet, which was the starch and fat centered diet, which we were put on during colonialism and slavery. And that's when everything started turning around. That's when we got into prolapsed uterus. That's when we got into fibroid tumors. That's when we got into infertility with that starch centered diet. Right. And, and that also leads me to this part, too, when we think about um, slavery uh -huh. and we think about how we were served or how what we could gather were the leftovers. Mm -hmm. All of that wasn't bad, but a great part of it was, particularly when you think about certain meats. Can you explain a little bit about that? Like when you think about things like chitterlings and, uh -huh. and, and other uh, body parts of animals that we ate because we couldn't get into the big house to eat other foods. Uh -huh. Well, you have to understand that uh, people were just doing the best they could to survive. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not faulting our ancestors. They were surviving in that time. But they knew how to supplement their diet with fibrous food. They were using slippery elm bark, maple leaves. They were using raw herbs and barks of trees to get the fiber into this diet, which we weren't, we weren't doing today. But they knew how to, some kind of way, make this diet more palatable. Sure. So they were eating the insides of the animals because uh, in that system, the Greek system of eating, they believe if you eat muscle, you gain muscle. So they won't eat in the muscle of the animal and they were leaving the innards, the guts, and the place where they store the bowel movement, the rectum of the pig, which people call chitlins or something for us to eat, the feet, mm -hmm. the ears, the eyes, all that, the tail and all that. But that's based on a religious system of how to eat meat and how to prepare it coming out of the Greeks and Romans. Sure. Yeah. When I think in terms of uh, the way we eat today, and when I think in terms of the way we used to eat, there's kind of like a common chord there. The, the chord being that, to some extent, we haven't quite figured out which direction to go and, and how we best want to get there. And when I think about that, I think about things that we need to change in our diet anyway, such as fiber and, and more water and less processed things. So what are some of the major steps that we could do, especially when we start to think about our youth and making sure that they understand that? Well, the thing is we have to see the diet for what it is. And diet's supposed to transmit and translate your culture. What you eat just should reflect your culture. When Chinese come here or Asians come here, they open up a market and send for their food because they associate food with their culture. Mm -hmm. And we don't associate food with our culture, and that is the problem, that one of the major problems with our dietary habits. The plate itself, which is round, was created in our culture and is symbolic of the sun god, Ra. And the round spoon symbolizes the moon god, and the sun and the moon got together and had four children. That's why he had four prongs on the fork. The whole situation is a ritual and ceremony that reflects and transmits our culture, but we don't see culture when we see our food. But if a Chinese person comes to America, they want to see China on a plate before mm -hmm. they can eat. Mm -hmm. Until we make the cultural connection, I don't think we're going to be healthy. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of terms, too, that I think are important for people to understand. And one is allopathic, and then the other is naturopathic. And I do know that the allopathic one is the one that treats the symptoms, and the other one is the one that... Um, help me out with that, helps to cause the symptoms that need to be treated. Can you explain a little bit so we can um, understand that better? Allopathic medicine is what people normally associate with MD medicine. It's based on giving the system poison. They believe if you poison the system, the system will get healthy. And it's mostly a, a religious and angiotical kind of belief system itself. 
So it's the same system you use when you drink alcohol, which causes your system to be damaged. It damages your nervous, your digestive system. And so when people get sick from drinking alcohol, they say they feel good. So it's a contradiction in logic, which we're playing in the body in itself. Mm -hmm. So allopathic medicine is based on if you poison the system, your body will have a reaction to get rid of the poison, and that reaction gets rid of the disease. Mm -hmm. Whereas naturopathic medicine gives the body the nutrients need, it needs to make its own decision. And it's coming from two separate ways of seeing the body. In the allopathic system, we believe that bacteria and viruses attacking you. So we believe in a combat kind of military way of looking at the body and bacteria. It's always a fight against the bacteria to kill them so you can be healthy. Whereas in naturopathic medicine, we believe that the body is never trying to hurt itself. The body is not stupid. If it kills you, it kills itself. So we see the body fighting back, like if you get a cut, you get an inflammation, which speeds up the circulation and speeds up the nutrients to the body. So inflammation is the body fighting to be well. Arthritis is the inflammation of the joints. It's the body fighting to be well. Cancer is the body fighting to be well. The body is always attempting to maintain its most important product, which is life. Mm -hmm. Whereas the allopathic system believe everything is the body trying to kill itself with arthritis, with cancer, with a cold. But a cold is the body using mucus to transport waste out. A cold is the body fighting to be well. Whereas in allopathic medicine, we believe the cold is the, trying to destroy the body. Okay, well, understanding these two different um, approaches to medicine, how is um, hereditary, wh heredity, where does that play in, in where we are in our health? Heredity is mostly, mostly a religious system. We, you're in more philosophy than you are in medicine now at this point. You can blame everything on your grandmother. She's dead, can't defend herself. So you say, heredity did it. It's my great-grandmother's fault, my great-grandfather's fault. That's good. You're blaming everything on someone dead who can't defend themselves. The only thing that's hereditary is, is death. Other than that, you're just playing around just blaming something because you don't understand it. So when you say that, you mean even diseases such as arthritis that may run in, in a family or seem to run in a family, or um, uh, diabetes, and this is what we're told all the time, that these things are hereditary. You go to the doctor, for an example, uh, women with breast cancer, the physician may say, well, you'll have to have a mammogram every year because your mother had breast cancer, your grandmother had uh, breast cancer, so it's, it's highly likely that you could become a candidate for that. So heredity in that respect, is there any real uh, concern for us with that, any credence to that? You're talking mostly philosophy here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I t it's philosophy. They have a predis predisposition for these diseases because they're following that same disease-producing diet. Mm -hmm. The diet is causing the problem. It's hereditary diet that the, the mother and the father pass down to the children, hereditary anger, hereditary self-hatred that we pass on. But uh, no, not in itself. Hereditary is just a cop-out when medical science just can't explain something mm -hmm. any other way. Okay. You, um, you mentioned what you did about the foods that we eat as I asked you about that a little bit er earlier. But um, it came to mind to me things that a lot of us eat, and I just want to know, I want to kind of pick your brain a little bit to okay, tell me sure. what's wrong with these and what's right with these. So I'll just give you some four examples. Okay. Okay, let's say, um, the, well, the typical American breakfast, I guess, for a lot of people is um, bacon and eggs and, uh, or sausage and eggs or pancakes and syrup and usually with white flour and, uh, or else jam, blah, blah. What's wrong with that? You're again talking about a starch and fat centered diet. Just because you're frying bag, bread and calling it a pancake doesn't stop it from being bread. Just because you put some cheese and some ketchup on some bread and call it pizza doesn't stop it from being bread. You're still in a starch and fat centered diet and that is the big problem here. What is happening is the, the, they take this whole wheat and send it to a factory and the factory eats the whole wheat. It grinds it up, takes out the fiber, the vitamins and the minerals and the moisture and the end product of it processing or metabolizing the whole wheat is bleach white flour. So what we're looking at is a waste byproduct of a factory that we're eating, and we call it bleach white flour, white rice. The factory's already eaten the food. Mm -hmm. There's no nutrients in it. There's no fiber in it. So, so it's been stripped of everything that your body needed before you even get right. a chance to and eat it. Right, and the main thing is we have isolated and concentrated the starch of the wheat. And any time you isolate and concentrate a substance, it is a drug. Mm -hmm. That's why you call certain chemicals like heroin and, and cocaine, once you process it out of the plant, you isolate and concentrate a chemical out of the plant, that makes it a drug. Sure. So we're eating drugs and calling them foods. 
Okay, I'll give you some more examples of breakfast, and you tell me um, how this sounds, if this is any improvement at all. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> if, if you had a scrambled egg in a, a pan. A dead with, chicken fetus. That's right. Unborn let, chicken. Let me, let me tell you okay. what it is, though. So if you had your scrambled egg, dead chicken fetus in a pan, mm -hmm. and you had Pam sprayed in there, you had a half grapefruit with no sugar, you had a slice of multigrain toast, and then the drink you may have water distilled or otherwise bottled and green tea. What's right and what's wrong with that for breakfast? Well, it's a good breakfast for someone selling laxatives or toilet paper because uh, other than that, it's just garbage. The problem is the body only deals with one signal at a time. Mm -hmm. You only see out of one eye at a time. The signal gets switched back and forth very fast. You only hear out of one ear at a time. The signals get switched back and forth very fast. So you get the illusion that you're hearing out of both ears or seeing out of both eyes, but that's physiologically impossible. So when you're eating oil, even if the oil is wrapped around a french fry or a pancake, the body says, I'm either going to eat the oil or the starch. And it says, oh, this is oil. So it tries to process this oil. And meanwhile, the starch ferments and rots and putrefies and becomes toxic, irritant, gas, and chemicals in the system. So frying is totally Wrong. Okay, so it's doing you no good. Right. So what if you had a boiled egg? You're still eating the fetus, so then that's no good for you either. Oh, wow. What What do you do for protein then? I mean, I, uh, fish, some seafoods, that type of thing. Where would a person go for protein if they wanted to have a good breakfast? And you said that you knew that the egg is is a, among the least You don't food. want to eat protein. Let's be clear on that. You want to eat amino acids and let your body build a protein, because these little things called amino acids are little bricks that the body makes into a wall that we call protein. Mm -hmm. So you want to eat amino acids. You want to get the amino acids from the same place that the cattle got it, and the same place that the fish got it. They got it from eating grains. The cow eats grains and makes protein. Mm -hmm. So you can get your amino acids from the soybeans or from other sources other than the cow. Okay, well give me an example of, of a good healthy breakfast that could be within anyone's reach if they're willing to make changes. Okay, we, we're talking about someone coming from what we call a junk food diet. Per, perhaps you're talking about someone trying to make a transition to a, a natural diet. Uh, transition to, yeah, let's yeah, try that. A, a good healthy <laughs> diet would be a transition. glass of water in the morning because that's all you really need. Okay, well that's what I have yeah, in the morning. So, so, but, but we're ounces talking ounces before I'm yeah, through. That's but about yeah. it. Okay. So we're talking about someone trying to make a transition from eating the fried foods, and drinking and eat at the same time, which no animal does, because mm -hmm. it dilutes the digestive enzymes to help your body break down the food and get the nutrients from the food. So you shouldn't dilute the strength of these enzymes to get the energy out of your food. So mm -hmm. you don't drink and eat at the same time. You don't combine starch with protein. That doesn't work because the body can either need be in one state to digest the protein or another state to digest the starch, and it can't make the decision, so it makes a decision on one over the other. We call it acid and alkaline states and, and and science. Okay. So the, you're confusing the whole body with mm -hmm. this whole diet that you just mentioned. But we have to remember that this food is made to be addicting. So there are chemicals in the food that cause the person to crave the food. So we have addicting chemicals in the food, which we call behavior modifiers, which re was released on the Nuremberg trial. So the unconfused dieter would eat what for a healthy breakfast? The unconfused dieter would have to realize they're addicted to the food. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything to the person until they admit that they're addicted. So they, to let's them. say they realize that. Okay, mm -hmm. then they need to take something called Crave Less or Crave X to get rid of their craving for sugar and salt. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I cannot help them. They need Crave X or Crave Less and take that according to the directions on the label. Those are supplements to mm -hmm. get rid of the craving for sugar and salt. That sure. they're gonna need. Okay, so they've done that. Now they've done that. Mm -hmm. Now they're used to this milk and cornflakes, which is illogical because milk doesn't combine with anything in nature. A pig drinks the milk from his mother's titty and doesn't eat cornflakes. Mm -hmm. You know, drink mm -hmm. the milk, suck on the titty, eat some cornflakes. A pig doesn't do that. Even a pig or rat doesn't do that because mm -hmm. milk does not combine with anything in nature. That's clear. So they're used to putting this cornflakes with the milk. So what we're going to do now is get a whole grain corn, which this guy named Kellogg's came out with, mm -hmm. a Battle Creek. And oh, we're getting a whole grain wheat. This Dr. Graham came out and called it Graham crackers. This, this natural food thing is not nothing anything new now. It, in the history, it was Dr. Kellogg's and Dr. Graham introduced these whole grains long ago. So we're going to use a whole grain 
corn. We're going to call that cornflakes, named after Dr. Kellogg. Okay. And we're going to mix that with a vegetable milk known as almond milk, soy milk, rice milk, oat milk, spelt milk, and we're going to use that. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to use instead of the cornflakes and cow's milk. Okay. Now we're all right. Now if they want sausage, we're going to have the texturized soy sausage, which tastes like Those sausage. Those are good. Yeah, eat them. So yep. we're going to have the, the soy sausage and our cornflakes with the vegetable milk. Now we're all right. We're in a nice transition diet. We can stay there forever. Okay. No problem. <laughs> and that's a start to your day. Uh, that's a start. Okay. But we're not gonna do the we're not gonna do the citrus. Okay. Citrus is both eaten with citrus and citric alone. We're talking about the grapefruit. Remember? Sure. We're yep. not gonna do that because that doesn't combine. You eat citric with citric. That means grapefruit goes with lemon, lime, and oranges. So they all stay in the same family. All the citrus are gonna right. be staying there together. They don't combine with anything. Okay. All right. So then you might wanna go through the day a little bit. Then it's time for a snack. How about Raisins and almonds, dried raisins, of course. That's well, that's a raisin, and yeah. then um, natural almonds. We got unsalted. a problem here. We got a problem here, because when God made this grape, it had water in it. Now you took the water out, and you call it a raisin. Mm -hmm. When you eat the raisin, the body has to put the water back in the raisin, rehydrate as we call it, put the water back in the raisin. Mm -hmm. So the body, you eat the raisin, the body is gonna turn it back into a grape before it can metabolize it. Mm -hmm. The body is gonna make it into a grape before it eats it. So it has to pull this water from somewhere, so it takes the water from your veins, your arteries, and your nervous system. That's because a raisin is a concentrated sweetener, like white sugar is a concentrated sweetener, maple syrup, honey, and all of these concentrated sweetness cause the body to lose moisture in the nervous system, the veins and arteries, the bones, reproductive system, prostate. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Uterus, mm -hmm. eyes. That's where all of this fluid is coming from. So therefore, you're saying that dried fruits, um, or I'm asking, are dried fruits uh, non-favorable to the diet if, if you choose to, to be healthy? Well, we're talking about a transition diet, right? We're trying to say this person they're going halfway there, but not all the way there. Right. So we're saying they have to drink more water. Uh -huh. If they're going to eat dried fruit, they have to drink more water. But if they drink a lot of water, they can have their raisins. I'm just, you're asking me to teach them the correct way to do something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to say the correct way to do something wrong, duh, <laughs> they would have to drink more water. Uh -huh. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Whether I, I think it's correct or not is another issue. But okay. I mean, uh, all know. right. Well, okay. Yeah. All right. So then what would be considered a, a snack that would be even more healthy. And, and, and as okay. you said, we're trying to teach this person the to, correct way to, to do, do something, something wrong. wrong. Oh, yes. Right. And we know they're a transition person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're saying that ideally, in your mother's womb, you were fed every four hours because mm -hmm. it takes that long for your stomach to empty. That's when the amniotic fluid is changed. It puts you on the right eating schedule for life. But we came out here and we get conditioned by another culture to eat mm -hmm. according to these other rules, which are culturally motivated. So we're saying that ideally, if you eat breakfast at eight o'clock, you should wait four hours for your stomach to empty and then eat lunch. If you eat before then, it keeps breakfast on your stomach. Mm -hmm. So you end up going to bed with all meals still on your stomach, causing what we call constipation, which is white plaque on your teeth and tongue, which is a sign that your body is all backed up with constipation, with manure. So ideally, they should not eat a snack. But if they're going to eat a snack, we mm -hmm. want to say the correct way to do this wrong thing mm -hmm. is to eat a whole grain snack, a whole grain snack of some sort. So maybe some, like you mentioned, some almonds and raisins, papaya, mango, different types of dried fruit with some nuts and seeds. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then uh, moving right along. Dinner, and then I'm going to move to another area, but I think it's helpful for people to understand exactly. It's, it's more tangible, I think, when you can envision what you might need to put in your body, which explains exactly what you've been saying. Um, for dinner, what if you had broiled salmon with dill and lemon juice, steamed spinach, and then maybe some brown rice? Um, can we do that? Ideally, <laughs> you want to do the vegetables with the meat. Okay or you do the vegetables with the starch, but you don't want to do the starch and the meat together. That is, that's not digestion, that's constipation. That's causing waste to accumulate in your system and eventually you're gonna pay for this thing. Mm -hmm. Eventually you're gonna pay for it. It's no free ride in nature. Whatever you do wrong, you pay for it immediately. Mm -hmm. You may not be aware of it immediately, 
but you pay for it immediately. Right. So what happens when you eat this meal that you mentioned, there's brown rice and the greens and the salmon and all of that. Well, it's not fried chicken now. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's broiled salmon. Yeah, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a fish too stupid enough not to get caught. So that tells you how smart you're going to be by eating it. Right? So uh, what we're saying here is that this stresses the system. The body says, this is stressing me to deal with this thing. Mm -hmm. And stress can be emotional, it can be social, it can be spiritual, it can be your relationship, it can be your job. And whenever you're under stress, it decreases the blood and nutrients to your reproductive system, to your digestive system, and to your immune system. So we got a problem here, because if you keep stressing your system, it's going to decrease the blood to your reproductive system, eventually your prostate it's going to deteriorate or your mm -hmm. uterus is going to deteriorate because anytime you stress the system, it reduces the blood to the reproductive system and the digestive system, which means you're going to have drastic reflux reaction, you can have diabetes, you're going to have liver problems, all those organs that work with the digestive system. Sure. So stress causes that. No matter where the stress is coming from, mm -hmm. that's a problem. So okay. you're stressing yourself with the diet and then you're stressing yourself from other things, social, your relationship, some kind of disease you may be having, it puts your body into this mode and the body goes into a defense mode and shuts down the blood to the reproductive, digestive, and immune system. You're going to have some problems eventually. Okay. Let me ask you this. Um, you think about the days that, that most of us grew up, and I think, you know, a lot of us, um, there are more baby boomers living in this generation than ever before, so I'll put myself in that category. Mm, okay. And we grew up on uh, grandma's pound cake and homemade rolls and... Uh, roast beef and maybe a little fried chicken and that type of thing. How realistic is it given the way that we have lived and, and the way that a lot of us live today for us to expect that we can make these kinds of changes? And in what regard do we make these changes? What, what is, is the moment right now that we can make these kinds of changes? And of course, I'm speaking to people who want to change. Some people don't want to change, and, and that's the way they want to live their life. But there are those of us who, like I say, grew up on comfort foods and what we called comfort foods and southern food. And, and soul food and all that. So how realistic is it given all of that, in addition to which, and I know I'm running on a little bit here, but I'm passionate about this part too, in addition to which the way foods are marketed to us. I mean, it's what we see all the time and, and I don't agree with it with a, an overwhelming amount of it, but I'm not trying to spout my opinion, I'm just saying in a universal way. Everything is packaged with sugar. It's glamorized with sugar for our children and, and sodas and this, that, and the. So when you look at that, Dr. Africa, there's such a tide that stems from where we know we ought to be to how we get there. So how realistic is that? Well, to be truthful with you here, the, the issue is that how do we teach someone who's been taught the wrong way? Mm -hmm. So the precondition has been set up by the lady's pregnancy, actually. If, if a lady's stressed in the first trimester, there's going to be some kind of nerve problems. If it's the lady's stress in the, in the second trimester, it's going to be some kind of a inability to engage into that masculinity or femininity because that's when your brain is masculized or feminized in the second trimester. Lady stress in the first trimester is going to be some kind of nerve problems. The third trimester is going to be some respiratory and skin kind of problems. So it's very important that the ladies is not stressed during, these, during the, the full the trimesters. We're not looking at that. And we're not looking at how the child learns. The child learns by what it sees, tastes, and hears in the mother's womb. So if you deprive the child from certain stimulation, that deprives them from certain thoughts, spiritual, mentally, forever. And this was proven by putting research where they took a baby chicken and put cloth over the chicken's foot. Mm -hmm. So the chicken couldn't see its foot for about three or four months, and then they took the cloth off, and the chicken would not eat worms. Certain thoughts are stimulated by what the baby sees in his mother's womb. It sees auras. So what we're talking about is the whole process of dysfunctionalizing the person starts before they're born. Then after the child is born, they introduce to called rote learning, which was introduced in 1922, which proven to be a failure in 1928, because it causes a person to cling to immature thoughts forever. Well, let me ask you, you this. Are you saying, therefore, that if uh, during pregnancy, yes. let's say this woman does all the things right, she eats her whole grains, etc., she knows her how to eat father. well. Okay, uh, and it's I like that, and I, and I, exactly. And so they're doing those things correctly. Are we saying, therefore, that that child is, is um, uh, more than likely to be born with a propensity towards eating 
the right way because she wasn't drinking yeah. um, evaporated milk with sugar in it and give and blah 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 she, because even baby formula has sugar in it which stresses the system but forget that this this chemical you call in sugar is classified as a drug and a drug stresses the system which decreases the blood to the reproductive system the digestive system, the immune system you see, so the lady is doing all these right things. And, and as you said, the father as well. The father is doing all, because mm -hmm. the father emotionally has an emotional umbilical cord connected to the child. We carry enough baggage. Right. We don't need all that alone, too. So <laughs> I'm saying this sort of process <laughs> will set the child up because we know that breastfeeding is a part of the culture. And the black women breastfeed the late least, and Japanese breastfeed the most in America. I strongly believe in breastfeeding. So without the breastfeeding, it denies a child the language to access his own intelligence. So we're looking at a whole dysfunctionality setup that predisposes a person to eat junk food. And we use infantilism in advertising. Because when you're an infant, you see these little characters, fairy tale characters, and mm -hmm. it makes you feel safe because your mother's taking care of you. So they always use infantilism in advertising, like a Burger King, a clown, or the Pillsbury Doughboy, because it lures you back into that sure. state where you feel comfortable. So all of this is part of addicting the person to the product. They don't want you to be anything but emotionally centered, not intellectually centered. Well, if I can just flash back a minute to what you did so well earlier, um, once upon a time, uh, black women, that's really all we did do was breastfeed our children. For ourselves or other people's mm -hmm, children. Mm -hmm, that's exactly. History. Oh, yeah, other people's without a doubt. Yeah, so, yeah but we did see, That's do part that. of our, our language. See, it's a certain language that a child has to get. And this is part of their language. Growth and development is an extension of the gestational. Uh, I don't want to get into too much. Work, sure, I understand. But it, that's part of how you develop language. And without mm -hmm. that, see, the child hears sounds, and that mother hears sound is reflected in tension in her breast. And also the way that the viscosity, the thickness and thinness of the breast milk would change if the woman is stressed or cussed at or called names, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So the child learns how to interpret sound, not by the language, but by the sound itself. And right. you can't deny the child this way of uh, learning. So with all of that, a person, I'm saying if all the right conditions <clears throat> are set, the mother and the father are eating properly, and the father has to nurture the mother, or else his emotional growth and development is hampered forever. These are things required by nature. You see, so that has to occur, and, and they're eating properly, and they're, not, they're doing things, you know, he's nurturing her, As writing her poems, done, walking sure. with her, singing to her, massaging her. All these things are supposed to be done to set up them on the right frequency to nurture the child. That's mm -hmm. part of his growth and development emotionally, get ready for the child. Mm -hmm. He has to do this. So, and that's not done, then the, per the child is dysfunctional forever. This is the way nature plays these rules. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is using this infantilism. They know that sugar is associated with love and affection. They know that smoothie tasting food is associated with nurturing or the inability to receive the proper nurturing. The junk food industry has junk the emotions, so they know how to pimp off the junk that they have done. Mm -hmm. So they, they actually make you dysfunctional, and then they profit off your dysfunctionality. Right. That's why a lot of people like creamy ice cream at night because they lack nurturing. They want to chew on something because they're trying to release the tension and stress. They want to crunch something because they're frustrated. They want salt because they anger. They want sugar because they lack love and affection. So the junk food industry knows how to set up these cereals and candy bars. But and sometimes stuff to can't you it. just want a piece of grandma's pound cake? I mean, sometimes you just. Well, I'm just teasing you, Doctor. Well, see, there's no such thing as a pound cake in nature. If you can show me a pound cake growing on a tree or Coca-Cola growing on a tree, these things. I don't are, drink These are freak foods. You see, <laughs> no one can relate to them. So right. you, you can't see anything that looks like a biscuit that grows on a tree. Okay. These are freak foods. I mean, they were created by the Greeks and the Romans, by the way. All of them sure. are sexually motivated. Well, speaking of sexually motivated, that takes me to another part, too. And I want to jump on melanin a little bit, too. But before I get to that, um, erectile dysfunction mm -hmm. in food. Mm -hmm. uh, on the airways today, that's all you see. And, I, and I'm always... Um, reading and, and always interested in, because I have sons and I have a husband, and I'm always interested in how men are affected b with this erectile dysfunction and diet. And it, there, once upon a time, you never heard about men having prostate cancer. And of course, it always seems that if anybody gets anything worse, we always do. So we have uh, higher incidences of prostate cancer and the like, breast cancer, even though you wouldn't know it the way it's Amongst always men. advertised. Amongst black exactly, men. Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there has to be a connection between prostate cancer and diet. 
That's there true. has to be. And I mean, and then they act as though it can easily be remedied. You just take, and I don't, I'm not going to get into all the brand names here, but you take Mr. Fix-It this and a dose of Mr. Fix-It that, and you're okay, and you can have a nice day. Yeah, these uh, things that we're talking about are basically what we call nitric oxide. Uh, that's what they use to cause this erection. Nitric oxide used to be called laughing gas, causes a psychosis. The guy thinks he's all of that and he ain't all that. He's just flat out crazy with the erection, you know what I mean? But uh, what we're talking about is the, the erectile inability to have erection. Mm -hmm. And this is caused because the, the system is under stress and stress reduces the nutrients to the prostate and the uterus. And anything that pulls moisture out of the tissue pulls moisture out of the prostate. That would be white sugar, alcohol, vinegar, anything that changes the sugar quickly, which would be bleached white flour, white rice, and white potatoes. All of these pull moisture out of the prostate along with stress, which shuts down the nutrients to the prostate, along with the fact that the prostate is a muscle. And when you tense your muscle from being in tension, tense all the time, it increases the blood to the muscle. So being tense, being under stress, taking things that dehydrate the body, such as bleached white flour, white rice, white grits, white potatoes, alcohol, especially acidic acid, vinegar, all of that's gonna pour more shot of the prostate. So to relieve that stress on, on men, since we're talking um, erectile dysfunction in the prostate, you, they, men should simply be aware of doing the reverse of that, the white flour, the... Yes, the they, they have to come off all of that stuff, and they have to understand that sex transmits and translates culture. Sex is culturally based. Chinese have a different sexual system from the Japanese. We think it's something called universal sex, but it's not that way. Each culture has different sexual rituals and ceremonies, because sex transmits and translates culture. We back to culture again. And the problem is that we have a predatory nature about us, because we're in a military culture. Sex is a form of power. That's what they, when you go into rape and rape counseling, you learn that rape is a form of power. It's not about sex. Sex is about power and the ownership of power. The more women I have sex with, the more power I have amongst other brothers, you see? It's not the sex. We're never after the woman at all. We're after the, what the sex gives us, the reward of power. But that depends on the woman that you ask. So now we're gonna to move to constipation. Yeah. <laughs> which also is caused by <laughs> too much sex. <laughs> and, and lack of fiber. Right. Yeah. Now let, let's explore this fiber thing because um, basic things like having colonoscopies done, mm -hmm. uh, which for most of us are true indicators of, of where we are sometimes with the fiber thing. Yeah. What do we need to do to, to, because knowledge has told me that after almost every meal, you should have a healthy stool after you eat. Um, and, and I know people who take laxatives on a regular basis, just like, well, a lot of people don't drink water, but like how you should be drinking water. Well, it's the food again. It's lacking fiber. They take the fiber out of the, the so whole it's grains. Mm -hmm. So you have nothing to exercise the internal muscles of your in small intestines and large intestines. They have to be exercised. They are muscles and they need to be exercised. And you cannot exercise them without fibrous food. That is steamed vegetables, not boiled till it's soft and mushy. They have to still be crunchy. And you eat a salad. So that you can recognize a cabbage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to eat fresh fruits and vegetables because they have fiber in it. And you want to eat whole grains. That would be spelt, kamut. These are grains that people are not aware of, but there are other grains other than wheat. We're wheat-centered, and wheat causes too much acid, and acid breaks down the system. It also causes stable madness and arthritis in cattle when you feed them too much wheat. So we got to come off all of this wheat and go into other grains. Some of the names are Kamut, Spelt, Amarantha, Kiwi. They're in, they're in the stores. I've been to the stores mm -hmm. here. They're in the stores. The regular grocery stores have them. So we got to oh, start wow. eating these regular whole grains other than the wheat and that flax is a good one too is flax it? we with some things we use just to help the food flow out like okra mm -hmm. and flax seeds turn into okra mm -hmm. in the body and help it flush out the food as well as slippery elm slippery elm powder it's a bark of a tree turns into salami like okra and helps wash the colon out so you want to eat flax seed meal not the seeds you want to eat slippery elm powder you want to eat okra 
And most of all, if you use the diet as the medicine, you have cured the whole problem. Because food is the medicine, and medicine is a food. And anything that can be cured with food should not be treated with anything else. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't kidding about the constipation, because that caused a lot of waste to be close to the prostate and uterus. Sure. So the waste is going to migrate to the prostate and uterus. By not having healthy bowel movements, you're destroying your prostate and uterus. So now we explored men in the prostate. So how are our women affected by fiber? Um, fibrosis tumors. Oh, well, see, we have a problem here. We have the same problem once again. We have the dioxin bleach that's in the tampons and the sanitary napkins, which causes inflammation of the vagina, inflammation of the, in the, in the, of the uterus, endometriosis, chlamydia, yeast, yeast infection. infections. Mm -hmm. All this is caused by the chemicals in the tampon and sanitary napkins, mm -hmm. which you should get the kind from the health food store that are not bleached. Mm -hmm. So now we have the uterus, which is high in sugar. So if you increase in the sugar in the uterus, then the sugar starts fermenting. What increases the sugar in the uterus is bleached white flour, white rice, white grits, and white potatoes. So we're talking about a high sugar driven diet, which causes the fermentation in the uterus, which ends up being a yeast infection or the tight nylon panties, which stops the air from getting to the vagina. Vaginal area, sure. Yeah, so we're talking about a diet that can drive a yeast infection, aside from antibiotics doing it. And we're also talking about the uterus is a muscle, and when you're stressed, the uterus gets tense too, and shuts down the nutrients to itself, and causes it to increase waste. Then you're talking about the chemicals that come out of the prophylactics. The talc causes cysts and tumors. The gel in the condom causes cancer. All of that leaks out during sexual intercourse and migrates into the uterus and vagina. So you're getting diseases from the prophylactics. You're getting diseases from the tampons and sanitary napkins, all of which you can buy from the health food store that doesn't have all the chemicals in it. Mm -hmm. Then we're talking about the whole fact that we don't have a healthy relationship with our reproductive system. We don't see sex as a spiritual activity. In our culture, sex is a spiritual activity. You should say a prayer before you have sex. That's what I'm saying. You should ask God to guard our relationship. May nothing come of it but blessings. If a child is the fruit of it, may the child be blessed. We should say a prayer before we have sex. But let me, let me move back, if yes. I may, rather quickly, though, with, with the tumors for women, though. The fibroids. Well, how, we, how we usually is... shrink them in my business. Mm -hmm. We use herbs to shrink the fibroid tumors. Um, three most popular ones are shepherd's purse, like a shepherd in the mm -hmm. field and a purse that ladies carries. Mm -hmm. Shepherd's purse, and it's a herb that's green called witch hazel, not the stuff in the bottle. Witch hazel, shepherd's purse, and another herb called crane's bill, or, or some people call it wild alum root, A L U M. Mm -hmm. Alum mm -hmm. root, witch hazel, shepherd's purse. You use all three of them together. Mm -hmm and that will shrink a cyst and tumor. Mm -hmm. You drink it, mm -hmm. and that will shrink it. But you have to do these other things correct now. Mm -hmm. You have to get off the junk food and get away from the synthetic estrogen and steroids, because the synthetic estrogen and steroids in burgers, chicken, and fish cause prostate disease and fibroids. Mm -hmm. This is synthetic estrogen and, and steroids in the meat and the dairy and the eggs. It causes a person to have a sex addiction they're addicted to sex, so they want to hear sex in the music. They want to see sex dancing, sex clothes. They become sexually addicted. So we have to come away from the synthetic estrogen and the beef, the chicken, the dairy, the eggs. It causes disease. It's caused prostate disease and uterine fibroid tumors. So we got to come okay. off all of that. Okay. Uh, melanin. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about melanin because you, you talk about melanin quite a bit in your book and the fact that... Um, it is, of course, what gives us our color. But can yeah. you explain the correlation between melanin and our health? Well, and who melanin, we are? melanin, of course, gives us our, this pigment, mm -hmm. uh, which we call black people, which is actually brown. And this melanin causes us to have more vitamins and minerals in our body than any other race. And it's in our nervous system that causes us to transmit messages quicker and store more information. And it's in our bones, which causes us to have more minerals in our bones than any other race. And it's in our digestive system, which causes us to have a more efficiently run digestive system. And it's in our eyes, causing our eyes to be brown so we see the full color of colors. It causes you to absorb more color. And it's in our ears and then we absorb more sound so our music will sound different because we hear more sound in the sound. Then the melanin is in your taste buds which causes you to taste food differently. You taste the full flavor of food. The more melanin you have, the more human you are. It's the biochemical marker for life. That's how we uh, judge the age of the brain, the half-life of drugs. If the drug doesn't destroy melanin, you can't evaluate its efficiency. So melanin is the biochemical marker for life, and it's studied more by the military than any other industry in this country. 
but we are not aware of the importance of this melanin. It's the center of every cell in your body, this little purple thing. And that's the new sun, the nucleus. It's the center of the cell, tells the cell when to breathe, when to eat, when to have a bowel movement. It's the melanin. Does your body regenerate melanin or you're born with the amount of melanin that will take you through your life? You're born with your, your stock of it and mm -hmm. you, you're going to make melanin. You have a melanin centers in your body. You make melanin all over, particularly in the pineal gland. It's a, center, a gland in the center of your brain mm -hmm. in the third ventricle. And you're going to make this melanin. It's a free radical scavenger. It protects you from infections. It fights radiation. It takes the, the sun's ultraviolet rays and turns it into vitamin D. It causes your black skin to eat the sun and your cholesterol transports it to the liver, and then the liver changes its vitamin D3 into to what we call vitamin D. Well, then the sun is the greatest source, most natural, and the greatest source of vitamin D anyway, isn't it? Yeah, and if you don't get enough sun, then you're going to be a little more sad, and you're going to have more skin cancer. That's why black women have more skin cancer than, than white women. Mm -hmm. You have to have adequate sunlight. Um, you have to have at least two hours of sun every day. The sun is what we, we're sunlight dependent. Right. And we're not getting enough, so it causes it to be more irritable and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. which we call seasonal affective disorder, because we're not getting enough sunlight. Sure. If you had to uh, name three things that we could do that we should um, guard against, three things that you consider primary for our best health, what would those three things be? Well, don't, we'd have no health without children. We should eat properly, eat, if it's not for ourselves, but for the children, so they can find a better way in life. We should see that this is the only life we have is our children. So I would say that you should eat properly just so they can see another way. Just because you are hampered, don't hamper them. Make that hereditary dietary ignorance. Don't pass that on to them. Give them a chance, eat mm -hmm. properly. That's the one thing I would say. The other thing is to understand the diet is culturally based. You have to have a culture to define what you should eat and what you should not eat. That's what does it for you. And the key to this whole thing is, to, is understanding your history because your history helps you understand your future. So we have to get a little more culturally focused here and understand the only product we have of any value is our children and understand that we are addicted. The industry makes us addicting. The addicting arm of the food industry is the snack food industry. So we have to take something for our addiction. And I mentioned two supplements, Crave X and Crave Less. And there's another one by now called R Slim. All of those will get rid of the craving. I, I would do that first and foremost. And then I would start thinking about these crossover foods that we mentioned, the soy burger, the soy sausage, the rice cheese, the, instead of cow's cheese, use rice cheese, soy cheese. Instead of white bread, use whole grain bread. I would think about all those crossover foods. Mm -hmm. That would be my, my, my main things so, yeah. there. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the children too because they are of utmost and primary concern and, and I'm, I'm concerned as are a lot of people about um, not only us and where we need to go but when you think about children the way they are in school today their, their lunch programs um, the peer pressure that they have to run to fast food places when they're in college the lack of formal eating skills and, and when I say that I mean eating the whole grains knowing what mm -hmm. to to choose from uh, we, we've got a, a lot to plow ahead to to break that mindset to help them to understand that wouldn't you say yes uh, understand that these vendors are in the schools now Burger King is in the schools Krispy Kreme is in the school and hospitals so they're, they're very pervasive and very powerful industry and they they lodge a military attack on people the people sit on the board of directors of Ralston Perina and all these corporations are military people and they see us as something to prey on. So we have to have an understanding of how this media is driven and they're not going to give up their market share that easy. You have to fight for your life. You have to fight for your health and know there's a fight till death. You have to, it has to be that kind of feeling in you. This is my life. I'm taking it back. Burger King does not own me, does not tell me how to eat. I'm not going to let a clown tell me how to eat. That is stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm a grown person here. I'm going to use my intelligence. I'm going to use some of the scientific information I have here. I'm going to understand that this is God's temple. I have no right to put this garbage in it. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. It's factory made garbage that's been bleached white. And we call it white sugar and white rice. It's just factory made garbage. And that's why we call it junk food, which is technically called pica, P-I-C-A. Pica is non-food. So we're eating pica. That's the problem. We eat in non-food disguised as food.
the tomatoes aren't tomatoes. Any old person can tell you those tomatoes in the store taste. They not. They don't taste. They'll Some tell you relatively that. young yeah. people can tell you yeah. that too. They, yep. These these are mm -hmm. freak foods, driven by splicing pigs and moths together and a whole lot of steroids shoved in these tomatoes with with uh, what we call. Uh, blockers in a manganese blockers to stop it from having seeds. Then you eat the manganese blocker and it stops you from having the nurturing ability because manganese is associated with nurturing. Mm -hmm. So you're eating these blockers, seed blockers, and they're freak foods. It's better to go to nature. If you, you're you mm -hmm. a natural product yourself and if you want to preserve your naturalness, you have to eat nature's food. That's a good point. And that leads me to another area, to organic foods. Um, or so-called organic mm, foods. Yeah, so-called. Um, <laughs> I they, thought I'd say that before you They're coming close, they're coming close, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how do they factor in our diet? Is, is that a, a better alternative for us in some cases? Ideally, ideally we should eat organic food. That's food that hasn't been treated with chemicals, synthetic chemicals or synthetic fertilizers, which is a poison. That's when they put poison in the soil and the seed grows fast to get the hell away from the poison. Mm -hmm. So when the soil is not poisoned by synthetic fertilizers and it the seed hasn't been spliced with another animal or human cell and it hasn't been treated with estrogen and steroids, we call that organic food. And we should be eating those type of foods. That's what we were raised on in Africa that's what the Chinese were raised on. It's American Indians are raised on. This this food that we're eating now is totally new in history. Nobody well, that's what a lot of us on. were raised on. I mean, I of know course. growing up in the South, my parents had a garden. Of course. That's organic, isn't yes, it? Yes. I mean, they grew their raising. own cantaloupe, that's their own tomatoes, collard greens, and mm -hmm. that's why I don't like cantaloupe today, yeah. because that's all I ever, <laughs> yeah. I ever ate. But I mean, we, really. We were raised we, on organic food, so mm -hmm. our health is a little different, but that's not what's going to happen with these new children. These children are chemically created. They have a chemical addiction. And you can tell a chemical child by picking them up. If they stiffen their legs or splay their fingers or do like this, that's called a fear reaction in a child. So if you pick up a baby and it does that, that's a chemically altered child. And they have to be treated differently. You cannot use Dr. Spock's book for this child. You have to introduce your, your movements and everything you want to do with them by tracking. You have to change your face when you say something, change your posture, and change your voice. This is called tracking. And when a child has been chemically altered, they cannot track. That's a button on the VCR. Mm -hmm. They lose the ability to track. So their nervous system is weak. So if you stare them in the eyes, they're going to do eye aversion and look away because it's too stressful in their system. They have been chemically altered. That's a different approach to them. If they walk by a room and the light's on it every day and you have the light off one day at a time, they go into confusion. They have confusion spasms. They can't track. That's like I'm doing my hand like this, and then I can bring my hand back like that. That's called tracking. So they're playing with a toy, doing like this. They can't reverse the order. They throw the toy down and break it. Then you say, why are you breaking all your toys? They lack the ability to track. That's a chemically altered child. We have chemical children, and mm -hmm. we're using these, these books that were created for children that aren't chemically altered. Dr. Spock's book, which was written after he took 15 years of Sigmund Freud. So there's Sigmund Freud all embedded in there. All these kind of things that a child is going to destroy itself and your mind is going to destroy itself and a child is beaten and all that sort of rush. Sure. Can't notions. go that way. Um, I want to ask you this too. Um, sugar. If you're not supposed to eat sugar, mm -hmm. but, but liking things sweet, I do believe, you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is, is natural. I mean, sugar cane... Uh, as I've heard you say before, certainly didn't come out like it does in a bag that we buy yeah, at the grocery yeah, store. True, and true. we all know what the cane looks like, or most of us do. But if you do want, and I also know, let me say this too, that in certain cultures, people in Africa and even in the Caribbean, people actually chew on the cane and they eat it for the sweetness. Now, if we want to have, since you've already convinced me that I can't have any more of my grandmother's pound cake, but if I mm. want something sweet, then what, what am I supposed to do? What, what, what can I share with my children so that they won't ask for Fruit Loops? And I'm just using that as an example. I don't buy that. Oh, yeah, anyway, we, we, yeah. We, we, I'm talking about someone who's in a crossover diet. Right. Now, that's what I'm dealing with here. Right. Because ideally, you only have a, a craving for one type of sweetness. That's breast milk. Okay. After that, you get lactose intolerance. And you no longer have that craving for sugar. That's a physiological fact. We have been engineered to crave sugar. Let's be clear on that. That is an engineered addiction socially motivated by the children's stories, all of which have sugar in it, Hansel and Gretel. We've been programmed to want this sugar. Let's be clear on that. Mm -hmm. The only sugar you naturally crave is breast milk, and after you become lactose intolerant, you no longer crave that. That's phys physiology, but now we're talking about socially engineered craving for sugar. So I would still go back with getting a supplement to get rid of that craving. Crave less, crave backs, or all slim. They must take that. 
Then in the interim, we're going to go to something that's green that has a chlorophyll kind of taste called stevia, which oh, is a naturally sure. sweet no. leaf. Mm -hmm. We don't want white stevia. Mm -hmm. We want green stevia where they just grind up the leaf and that's a naturally sweet leaf. I would go there as a crossover type of sugar. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. other than that, uh, sugar is not necessary in the diet. In the if you diet. want something sweet, eat an apple, orange. Small onions taste sweet. A mm -hmm. small onion is sweet. A small potato is sweet. Already, the sweetness in broccoli, if you get, cultivate a natural taste, you will taste the sweetness in these sure. foods. But sure. uh, what we're looking at is people that are addicted to sugar, and that's totally different. We do not have caught hunger specific. We have program hunger, and that's a problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Africa, I think we've covered just about everything that I... Um, I mean, there's so much that's important, but the, the areas that I think that we could really touch base with and help uh, our viewers to understand exactly what we mean by healthier eating, unless there's a message that you really want to leave with us here at the end. Well, I think that we start using those herbs, as people call them. We need to start taking red clover, garlic, uh, burdock root, dandelion root to cleanse our system so we can be healthy. Okay. Yes. I appreciate this. <laughs> Thank you. So much more to learn. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Enjoyed it. Thank you. for this pizza. Yeah, good stuff, ain't it? Mm -hmm. All right, can I have a seat? Please. Sure. Uh, Help yourself if you want some pizza. Uh, that doesn't look too healthy to me. Well, it's got tomatoes on it. Uh, cooked tomatoes are not nutritional. You destroy the nutrients by heating it. Oh, I thought tomatoes were... Mm. Well, we got a lot of oink out here. You, you like pastrami, don't you? Well, that is mostly recycled uh, rancid milk they used to make that cheese. Oh, so what about the mushrooms? The, the mushroom, mushrooms no, you shouldn't cook the mushroom. It makes the minerals in it too coarse to digest. Pizza sauce? I don't think that's the right food combination, mixing milk with meat and meat with a fruit. You shouldn't mix fruits with starches anyway. You got a fruit with a starch, which you call a tomato. So that's going to cause some digestive problems. And the cheese is going to cause constipation, plus it's recycled rancid milk anyway. Well, what about the pepperoni? Well, the pepperoni was probably dried by, by sulfur, which is going to cause your bones to get brittle. All right. Now, wait a minute. This is one of the biggest companies in town, one of the best pizza companies in the city. And? And you're trying to tell me this is garbage we eat here? Well, it's mostly a ceremony. It's not really nutrition. You're just going through a ceremony where you're putting something in your mouth. You really shouldn't mix the cheese with the meat and the meat with the starch and the starch with the fruit. It's going to cause constipation and probably lead into some arthritis and infertility, hair loss, and but things like that. But I'm hungry, brother. You don't have natural hunger. You have hunger created by the television commercials you've been watching. Well, I'm going to have this KFC then. Right. If the pizza's not good for me, then I'll have the chicken and coleslaw. Coleslaw's good, coleslaw right? Coleslaw with vinegar. Vinegar is a poison known as acidic acid. I don't think you should eat a poison. It doesn't make sense. Mashed potatoes, though? Those mashed are good. potatoes, uh, those are not fresh potatoes because the powder would have turned black. So actually they bleached it so it would stay white, and then they added sugar on it to make you want it to eat it. They bleach my potatoes? Yeah, they bleach it white and add sugar to it. Okay, what about the chicken? Uh, dead meat, rancid meat. When they cook it, it, the flesh turns into fermented, putrefied waste, and the liquid coming out of it is cooked pus. And then you put starch with it, which is flour, which is going to cause constipation. Right. They can't inspect chicken in less than three seconds. They can't, can't expect any corpse in that less of time, so it's filled with worms anyway, and parasites. It probably irritates your skin. Make you feel hungry and the worms gonna crawl around in your prostate and then you're gonna think you're sexy aroused when it's actually the worms. Okay, what what do you think I should try to eat then? Oh, I haven't brought an apple with me. I wonder why you just can't Wait eat the food the way it is. This is the way God made it, just the way God made it. So it's not gonna it's gonna keep me the way God made me. That has been denatured, processed, killed, 
more than likely it's going to process you and cause you to be killed. Well, you certainly you got, we can certainly have a Coke here. Now, you can't have any complaints about that, sir. Coke is made carbonated. You know, like you breathe out carbon dioxide, and it's made with carbon monoxide, and your body's trying to get rid of carbon dioxide, and then you're drinking it? Well, but it says it's okay on television. Well, it's robbing your brain of oxygen, so you can't think well anyway, so you probably doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it's liquid sugar, which is going to probably lead into diabetes and kidney failure and blindness. Is there a lot of sugar in this? Yes. You, you're eating at least 15 teaspoons of sugar. So if I have a dinner with vegetables and then fruit on my plate, is that going to be okay? or? Mm, no, that's not okay. You, you're mostly eating for ceremonial reasons, and you're not e eating for nutrition. No animal combines fruit with uh, vegetables, as you call it. So eat them one at a time? You eat the fruit with the fruit. You eat sweet fruit with sweet fruit, and you eat greens with greens. You don't mix them together. They don't even grow together in nature. You're putting things together that don't grow together. But don't you think people will think I'm weird if I'm out to eat and I eat only vegetables or only fruit? Or? Well, more than likely you're eating with people that are addicted to this food. You're eating with food junkies. So you're eating around a bunch of food addicted people. So naturally, addicts together think they're all healthy. But actually, you're sick because there's nitrites in there. That causes what they call mad cow disease. So now you're going to be a little psychotic. <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah, you'll be psychotic, but then your friends are half crazy anyway, so that y'all probably wouldn't notice it. So we spent all this money on this food for nothing. Well, that's not called food. It's called junk food. Junk food well, is a partial food. food. I still spent my money on it. You've spent your whole dollar to buy partial food. That doesn't make sense. Well, I tell you, just for the... Just because we spent our money, I'm about just helping us have some of it this time, and the next time around, we'll try to get healthier stuff. Well, see, the Greeks shaped this food like it is, so that's that's symbolic of a, you know, vagina. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I've learned a lot. I I'm glad I didn't go ahead and eat that. Yeah, so am I. Well, I'm happy 